Welcome to Go Open, the world's only program dedicated entirely to open source. What's open source? It's what happens when people from Cape Town, hippies, get hold of software. Stop hogging, share, share, kumbaya. I'm just kidding, but it's kind of like that. I'm going to explain it as we go. Very exciting, and it's not just about PCs and laptops and hubs and bits and bytes and hubs and terminals and portals and gateways and all that. There's more to it because it's a modern world even though our children will look at it one day and go, <laughs> interstellar travel, what were you thinking you weirdos, what do you call that, the fur tracker thing? And then later on we have a competition where we ask you questions, you give us answers and we give you prizes. It's fantastic and there's lots of them. Go open. Open source software exists as a result of the combined efforts of millions of computer programmers, users and software vendors from around the world. They share their intellectual property freely and they believe that software should cost nothing and should enrich the lives of users. Open source software is the alternative and biggest challenger to closed source or proprietary software. It generally costs the user nothing. It can be distributed freely to anyone. Download it, use it, modify it, and give it away. It's a whole new world. Open source is the future of computing. And now for our main story. That's correct, a homegrown success. We have an exclusive interview with Mark Shuttleworth, South Africa's favorite internet billionaire. And we talked to him about how um, the open source was key to his success. Cape Town is known as the mother city, and it's here where South Africa's first internet billionaire Mark Shuttleworth made headlines when he sold his company Thought Consulting for a record three and a half billion rand. Most people are familiar with that story, but did you know that open source played a large role in his success? The US had a bunch of laws which tried to regulate how cryptography could be used by American companies doing business internationally. And I thought that would present an opportunity to do an end run around that and provide cryptographic services and software to people globally um, where Netscape and Microsoft and IBM couldn't compete because of really silly laws in America. And because I'd become familiar with open source software, I knew that the tools, the web server tools are available and I knew that the cryptography tools are available. It was just a matter of putting those two together. It was a way of starting to meet the engineers who did the um, the, the cryptographic work for Netscape and for Microsoft. And that then provided an entry into the certificate business, which is another aspect of the same industry. What exactly is a digital certificate? A digital certificate is a way of making sure that you know who you're actually talking with when you encrypt communications. Um, basically what you do is you, you, you both agree to trust some third party, and that third party issues a passport to, to, to you and I. And, uh, and then we can communicate using those passports. And the third party is not involved in the communication. So when we set up Thought, we weren't actually brokering all of the transactions that happen online. We were simply saying, this is Amazon.com. And then you could connect securely to Amazon.com and know that you could give them your credit card details and so on. So a large part of the business is the reputation that the issuing authority has. Many businesses in the States never even really thought to step up and try to get into that industry because they thought it would be dominated by the Ernst & Youngs and the, um, the IBMs, people with a strong established technology or trust relationships and reputations. But the reality was the business was so small and the, the potential risks so high, none of those guys wanted to do it. And so there really was a, a sort of counterintuitive opportunity for a little guy to climb in. Initially operating from his parents' garage, Mark grew his company first into a converted house and then into custom-built offices. It was a time when the internet was expanding and e-commerce was taking off. One of their main competitors, VeriSign, was a key player in the corporate end of the market. What started to happen was that first the internet was starting to take off outside of the US and so there was more growth outside of the US and also it was starting to become clear that small businesses were a bigger market than large businesses for these digital certificates and so they figured it would be easier to acquire an, a, a player that already had a stake in those sectors than to try and change their business model accordingly. After lengthy negotiations, Mark accepted an offer totaling $575 million or 3.5 billion rands. A few months later, the internet bubble burst and stock markets swayed as tech companies started losing profits. But an interesting observation on the whole bubble bursting. Um, if you look at the number of certificates sold, which is really directly correlated to the number of businesses running on the internet, that number has continued to grow. So even though um, 
Wall Street and the NASDAQ um, got flattened because people realized that the internet is you know, just like any other business environment. Having said that, it's still an incredibly vibrant and dynamic place to do business. And there are more and more businesses starting up, more and more devices connected, more and more people connected. So while the, the bubbles burst, the revolution has con continued. So, with a fortune at his disposal, what was his next frontier? Space. Like many young boys, Mark had always dreamed of flying to space. When American millionaire Dennis Tito bought a seat in the Soyuz for $20 million, Mark decided to follow suit. But he didn't want to be a mere passenger. When he finally took off on the 25th of April 2002, he took along with him projects on stem cell research, HIV and human physiology. This is where the stem cell and embryology experiment is uh, currently housed. Space, the final frontier. Or is it cyberspace? Mark is pioneering new opportunities in the world of open source in South Africa and beyond. He recently launched Ubuntu Linux, a full operating system and software package on one CD that is available free of charge. I've made a commitment that the software will always remain absolutely free. So it's an interesting experiment. On the one hand, uh, I'm putting resources back into the open source community, and I feel good about that. If Ubuntu doesn't become sustainable, at least I feel like I've, I've, I've helped accelerate and, and inject money back into a community that really empowered me to, to build thought. Um, but if we can build services around that software that pay the salaries of the people who produce the software, then that will make me feel even better because I can go on to other projects, and, and that I know will then continue to grow and continue to thrive. A lot of people think that Shuttleworth is hot because he has a lot of bread. Well, he does. He has bread and dough on top of the bread and then some more bread and dough on the dough. But next up, you're going to meet a machine called the Freedom Toaster and it cooks. Mark Chase, our intrepid reporter, went to Cape Town to find out about a very different kind of toaster. It's called the Freedom Toaster, and it's best served with lashings and lashings and lashings of open source. So you want to get Linux. Here's the problem. It's 700 megabytes, and with a dial-up modem in South Africa, it could take you one heck of a long time to get this sorted out. Here's the solution. The Freedom Toaster. What's the Freedom Toaster? Well, let's ask Jason from the Shuttleworth Foundation. Uh, we all say that open source and Linux is free, but connectivity in this country adds a price tag. So what we've come up with is the Freedom Toaster, and it's basically just a computer, regular everyday computer with three CD-ROM drives in it that write your CDs for you. And they do that simultaneously. All you have to do is just choose what you want, and it'll do it for you while you wait. Now you're going to show me exactly how easy you say it is to get uh, my favorite distro off the system. There's a no more button over there. Now if you just want to know more about Linux and you don't want to burn CDs, you can go through that process. However, if you want to just burn your CDs and you want to get out of here, you can click choose distribution. Many Linux distros take up three CDs or more, which is why the Freedom Toaster has three independent CD burners, a world first in programming terms. It took just seven minutes to burn the entire Mandrake distro. Simple as that. Yeah, what are the plans for the future for the Freedom Toaster? Well, we're busy redesigning it, so that's happening currently. And then we're going to look at rolling this out nationally. And uh, we're going to have a website that's going to tell everyone about where the toasters are and so on. And that's uh, www.freedomtoaster.org. When you're surfing the internet, your web browser requests pages from the site that you're connected to. The Apache web server is a piece of software that serves up about 70% of those pages worldwide. Now, in order to understand this entire list of things, we sent Mark Chase, because you know he's quite good like that, to talk to one of the founders of the Apache Foundation. And his name is Dirk Willem van Gullik. And this is what he had to say. There were people, uh, myself included, who basically had a, were given a task by their bosses, by the institutions, to basically maintain a web server. In my case, basically, my boss wanted me to uh, make satellite pictures available, uh, weather pictures available to scientists, and for quite a while, that actually worked really rather well, except that at one point, uh, Rob McCool, uh, who was well, like one of the main developers at NCSA in America, left to form Netscape. And all of a sudden, there was this web server piece of software, which we all depended on for our jobs, suddenly was left out there orphaned. So what started to happen was that we sort of like started to collaborate together to maintain that piece of software, to make it better, to basically make it needs of like our like daily demands. That basically became the Apache web server at one point. 
How popular is the uh, Apache server? The, the word well, that sort of like originated from, from CERN in Switzerland. And, and with it came a very like, small server, which was only really suitable to be run on, on mainframes at that time. Um, since then, basically, we've sort of like grown from like being just a few percent to like well over like 70 percent of the, of the web servers in the world. Uh, specifically, if you go to like the very large super sites like Yahoo, like Amazon, um, those are typically the sites which run the Apache web server. So if you actually look on the wire, if you look at like the number of pages being served by Apache or the, the amount of bandwidth Apache that we use worldwide, uh, the numbers are even higher than that 70%. A lot of people who believe in open source say it's empowering not only to developers but to users as well in the end because it's about freedom versus being dominated by proprietary software and those proprietary software developers. What is your whole feel with regards to open source and the future in that? I have to disappoint you there or basically disappoint people who are looking in the Apache Software Foundation sort of like for people on a mission who really want to evangelize open source in the world. Most people in the Apache Foundation um, are actually not quite like that. They're sort of like they typically have like real jobs, real customers, um, who just have like demands. And they've found that the cheapest way or the, the highest quality way or some other compromise um, way of actually serving their customers is by using open source software and collaborating by others. So most people are simply there because it's, it makes sense to build software together. What threats do you foresee the internet will face in the future? Right now, you can use the same web browser, the same web server, anywhere on the internet. Whether you're in China, in America, in South Africa, it doesn't matter. Everything can talk to everything, and everyone can basically use the same language there. And of course, there is always a risk that at some point, um, a certain area of the internet sort of like starts to speak their, speak their private language. Dirk, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, thank you for joining us here at Go Open. And uh, from all of us, you have a wonderful day. <laughs> I'm kidding. I was kidding. It's a joke. <laughs> Here's a story to warm your little heart. Gail Reed hated school, but she came back, and with the help of the Shuttleworth Foundation, she transformed her old primary school into a technological marvel. Wonderful. Kensington is a quiet, working-class suburb in Cape Town, which managed to escape much of the turmoil of the apartheid years. One of its most successful children is Gail Reed, who cut her teeth in the field of computer supplies. Two years ago, she and her husband founded their own business in Johannesburg. It was daunting. It was good nerves. I knew that that was going to be, after five years, um, I knew that I wanted to start, it, start my own company. Gail's company has gone from strength to strength, but she hasn't forgotten her roots. Hello. I can't remember any uprising in this area and to me it just seemed as a child it was a normal upbringing. We didn't know how it was going to affect us. Gail was schooled at Windermere Primary School in Kensington. When she was a child the school had no library. Last year she donated 120,000 Rand to start a library and create a computer lab. But the school needed help to set it up. We heard about um, the Shuttleworth Foundation that was assisting school. Uh, we then applied and within no time I think we were responded to and um, the response was very positive, as you can see. They walked in there at about 20 past nine, and they told us, right, we're gonna get started. Um, we went into the corridor, I rolled out the cables, children were hands-on, everybody was involved, and um, it was amazing for me to see that within the space of less than three hours, we had all these computers, all of them were up and running, and um, it was all systems gone. Part of why I got interested in the project is because I wanted kids to have a different learning experience and also be prepared for what's out there. The Tux Labs project is placing computer labs in schools across the Western Cape. In keeping with the philosophy of building on existing resources, refurbished computers are often used, running free of charge software. Volunteers are often sought within the school to create a culture of involvement and ownership. This has proved to be a very cost-effective method of deploying IT in schools. When I spoke to the, the co-sponsor of this particular lab, she had 120,000 set up to set up 10 computers in this particular lab. Um, they were also under understanding that they should buy um, the proprietary based licenses, which was not included in that particular budget. Um, so the cost would have been higher. Open source software solved that problem as Tux Labs always installs a free of charge version of Linux. And the Tux Labs boffins were able to bring in cheaper, refurbished computers running on a thin client network with just one powerful server doing all the hard work. 
Instead of 10 workstations, they were able to install 40, with money left over for library books. People will realize that these things are not really sort of door stoppers, you know, you can turn them into workstations and make a real impact in a child's life. I knew that should the school have PCs available to the kids, it would just open up their world a bit more. You don't have to be a school to benefit from free software. Oh no, no way. Mighty businesses need enormous, vast, huge suites of office applications and many of them will pay for them, but some won't. Mark Shuttleworth is doing it with Open Office. <laughs> Today we'll be doing it with OpenOffice. OpenOffice is a business productivity suite, so it has several different pieces of functionality built into one piece of software. It has a word processor for creating documents, a spreadsheet for working with mathematical functions and tracking business expenses, and it has a presentation package that will allow you to give presentations. Today we're only going to touch on two of those pieces of functionality, the word processor and the spreadsheet. I use OpenOffice every single day. That's how I exchange business documents with colleagues here in South Africa and all over the world. No matter what software they're using to write those documents, I can usually exchange my documents with them without any trouble at all. Creating a text document is exactly the same as how you're used to doing it, in whichever word processor you currently use. It's feature-rich and offers you a host of templates to choose from. What's more, it's fully compatible with all of the popular word processing packages you currently spend money on. The spreadsheet component of OpenOffice is equally familiar. You won't even realize that this spreadsheet isn't the one you've been using all your life. It has all the expected formula functions and creating charts from your tables is a cinch. One major advantage of OpenOffice is the price. It's completely free. And because it's open source, developers are continually improving it, making it a very stable package. You can find out more about OpenOffice at its website, www.openoffice.org. It's freely available and runs on Windows, on the Mac, and also on Linux. You see, that's the good thing about OpenOffice. It's free, and it's free. It's free in both senses of the word. But if you're some big company that needs to spend lots of money, like thousands and thousands, get the free OpenOffice and give the thousands to a school that needs the money, and everyone wins. They get the money, and you get to say, I spent the money. So everyone's a winner. It's fantastic. Now, coming up as a, a man, a geek really, he's sort of like a guy, but kind of different in a way that he likes to be. He knows all about free BSD, which is very exciting. It's like all the bad things without the penicillin. In the meanwhile, keep your trigger finger happy because you need to SMS us so you can win the competition and get the thing with the thing that's got the thing. So that's gonna be huge. Neil Blakey Milner. Welcome, Neil. When you say that there's freedom, or that there is, let's say, f the free software kind of movement, yeah. um, let's just define that for people who, who may think that that just means that there's no money changing it. When, when you receive something, you should be free to use it for anything you feel like, for example. You should be free to give it to someone if you feel like it. You should be free to change it. And to be able to change it, you need to be free to have the, the source code for it. How do you make money from open source? There are a few companies who try and work entirely around services. So they provide something, they develop it all in-house, and they provide support around it. Okay, so in your ideal world, how would software exist? I don't see proprietary software disappearing. Um, I don't think there's necessarily a need it should disappear. It, it fills a whole bunch of specific niche areas very well, especially small areas, areas of science, things that are really hard technically the things that you don't want to talk about, like the routers and the networks and all the rest of it. Uh, open source makes a lot of sense. Neil, it's not as simple as just having sort of, you know, open source and that's it. They're obviously within open source, there are different areas of thought. Yeah. Can you just explain FreeBSD? For me, the, the philosophy of FreeBSD really is um, providing something for anyone to do anything with for any purpose whatsoever, without any restrictions. The minimum requirements really are that you, you have to tell people that when you distribute the code that, that you are the author and that uh, when you distribute, if you use the code, then you can't come and sue me. What, what are the sort of achievements that, you know, have happened because of this freedom? Well, I mean, the, the biggest example really is probably the, the, the Mac OS X operating system by, by Apple. They, they took a very t serious change in architecture and to achieve that by writing the whole thing themselves would have just been an insane endeavor. 
And so they used a, a lot of programs that, that are available in FreeBSD and, and things around that as part of their operating system. So and as a FreeBSD developer, as someone who's contributed code to it, you know, there's a very good chance that the, that the code that I've worked on might be available to you know, millions of people around the world, not just you know, techies and geeks and so forth. Okay, cool. That's very good. Thank you. It's almost that time again. Winner time. Yes, I'm talking to you, the big winner. But first, get your browser to these web addresses. So, what's on the web today? Well, if you're looking for a bit of local flavor, Alistair Otter's Tectonic website is Africa's source for open source news. And it's exactly what the name implies. Up to the minute news and information on what's hot in the world of open source right in your own backyard. So head to www.tectonic.co.za. And if the news is too good and you want to channel your excitement, there's only one site to surf to. HappyPenguin.org is the place to download free games for Linux. You can search the archives in a variety of ways, or you can take potluck with the games displayed on the front page. With user rankings, you'll never download another dud. One of the most addictive games in the world is Pingus, a free version of Lemmings. All you need to do is type Pingus into the Happy Penguin search box and download the game for free. Now this is an action-packed puzzle game that'll pit your wits against nature. Everything that's hot and happening on Africa's open source scene is at www.tectonic.co.za and you can download all the games you'll ever need at happypenguin.org especially Pingus, a free game that's easy for you to download. It's time for the competition. Fantastic prizes this week. Jeans from Soviet, it gives a 17-inch flat screen monitor from LG, some DVD drives and, uh, and also a package from HP that's got a fantastic camera and an even better printer and altogether it's called the Filter Smart Suite. It's fantastic. All you have to do is answer the simple question, Mark Shuttleworth went to space in the Apollo, the shuttle or the Soyuz, that's the Russian one. Okay. SMS your answer to the number on the screen. I believe that's 34357. And remember, it's two rounds in SMS. And the winners of last week's competition are... Willem van der Walt wins a 17-inch LG monitor. Elise van Sel and Balan Moodley win LG DVD drives. William Ledwaba and Francois Hugo receive a thousand rand Soviet vouchers each. And Marina Khrief wins an HP digital camera and printer. Congratulations! Okay, next week, join us as we walk along some controversial territory. We find out about intellectual property. Who actually owns the things that come trickling out of your head? But not only that, we also talk to the man who took on the Disney Corporation. And we meet a music CD that not only are you allowed to copy, but that you're supposed to copy. I don't know. It's so crazy, it just might work. Only on Go Open. See you next week. <laughs>